in the battle for France, Germany would field a highly organized and motivated fighting force. By May 1940, 94 French divisions containing two and a quarter million men were deployed to meet the expected German attack. However, much of their artillery dated from the First World War, and they were dangerously short of effective anti-tank and anti-aircraft guns. French and British tactical doctrine regarding tanks and aircraft lagged far behind the Germans. Both the high commands considered tanks as first and foremost an infantry support weapon. The few French armoured divisions formed by 1940 contained only half as many tanks as their German counterparts. Between them, the Allies deployed 3,100 tanks in May 1940, but they were widely dispersed amongst the infantry divisions. As for the French Air Force, it could field only 740 modern fighters and 140 effective light or medium bombers. These were reinforced by 350 aircraft from Britain's RAF, attached to the BEF. The Allied aircraft were dispersed amongst the different areas of the front in just the same way as the armoured forces were. This made it impossible for individual army commanders to obtain a sufficient concentration of air power at the right moment. This shortcoming would be one of the major factors in the outcome of the Battle of France. The French Army's standard light tank from 1935, the R-35, was used in an infantry support role. 855 R-35s equipped the army in May 1940, making it France's most numerous tank. Extremely slow, it was unsuitable for mobile strategic operations. Like all French tanks, its effectiveness was limited by the fact that its commander had also to act as gunner, loader, and radio operator. First developed in the mid-1930s, the Char B was a formidable weapon, with thicker armor than any Panzer. It mounted a 47 mm gun in a revolving turret, backed up by a 75 mm gun in the hull. Though limited by a short operating range of 85 miles, the Char B could cope with any German tank pitted against it. Like other French tanks, it was poorly deployed by the Army Command. The Matilda II would prove to be the best British tank in the Battle of France. It was one of the earliest tanks to have a hydraulically controlled turret. Designed purely for infantry support, its cross-country speed was little faster than walking pace. The Matilda was the best protected tank of its day, but it suffered somewhat from poor vision and mobility. During the interwar years, the French army was regarded as the most formidable in Europe. By 1939, this reputation no longer stood up to close scrutiny. Throughout the 1930s, recruitment had fallen and funding declined due to the depression and the large costs of the Maginot Line. The troops received only 50 centimes a day, compared to a British private's daily allowance of 17 francs. This caused great resentment amongst the French rank and file their living conditions were uncomfortable and impoverished. Discipline was lax, 
with soldiers often neglecting to salute their officers and even leaving their barracks each weekend without permission. Many of the officers did their level best to secure a posting far behind the lines, away from the dreariness and danger of the front. The winter of 1939 was the coldest in 50 years, making life at the front harsher still. Training and work routines were curtailed, which gave rise to idleness and then boredom. Amongst the BEF, where the officers insisted on keeping their men busy, morale was a good deal better. Their months of waiting were spent improving defence works and completing the training of the recently raised Territorial Army units. For the French soldiers, however, their army's ingrained defensive strategy added to its inertia and further sapped their fighting spirit. On May the 10th, the French army would go into battle with a fatal mix of apathy and disharmony. By the spring of 1940, there was a widespread belief amongst the French army that the war would be settled by diplomatic agreement, without a shot being fired. On May the 7th, normal leave was restored to the army. By now, relations between Paul Renault and General Gamelin had completely broken down, and on May the 9th, the French Premier offered to resign because his government would not let him sack the general. In the wake of the Norwegian disaster, Britain's Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was also preparing to resign. That same evening, the Luftwaffe informed Hitler the weather on May the 10th will be good. Later that night, the code word Danzig went out to the already alerted German units, signalling that the long-awaited offensive would begin at 0535 hours. The long gathering storm was finally about to break. On the 9th of May 1940, all along Germany's western borders, the forces of the Wehrmacht were packing up and getting ready to move. Hitler's insistence on secrecy and speed was followed to the letter. Even frontline commanders were not informed of the offensive's launch until the last moment. In the early hours of May the 10th, Luftwaffe crews were roused out of their beds and told to be ready for action within 15 minutes. Before dawn, every available Luftwaffe plane was airborne. Meanwhile, long columns of panzers were leaving their quarters and driving along the approach routes to France and the Low Countries. At first light, the skies over Belgium and Holland were suddenly filled with the roar of Luftwaffe planes. Wave after wave of fighters, bombers and transports swept over the frontiers. After eight months of uneasy peace, war had finally come to the West. As he prepared to launch his great offensive, Adolf Hitler left Berlin with his entourage in his personal train. Despite the wariness that some of his generals continued to feel about the coming campaign, he felt supremely confident. He asserted that the French were too fond of easy living and lacked fighting spirit. He declared that by applying all means at its command, Germany could deliver one gigantic...